This chapter also ends with a strong we. And it's not the we of universal sin, although, as I just said, we can't forget that. It is the we of belonging to the family of God. Now, earlier in this chapter, there is a wall between Jew and Gentile, and it says that our Lord Jesus Christ tore that down so that the two would become one, one people of God, not an us and a them anymore. This is God's people. The Lord Jesus continues to tear down walls that are between people. We talked a little bit about that. What are the walls in your life that need to be removed? If you have a wall that is helping you love other people and love God, that's a wall that's a good wall. If you have a wall that is preventing you from loving the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind and all of your strength and loving your neighbor as yourself, that wall needs to come down because we are part of God's house. We are believers, part of the body of Christ. And that's true everywhere we are. That's a good thing. You can't run away from God. Now, the psalm that we had, uh, Psalm 84, I just love Psalm 84. Maybe we've been using it a lot in worship, in part because I love it, but it talks about the beauty of being in God's house with God's people. That one line in there, I'd rather, I'd rather be the door doorkeeper at the house of the Lord than dwell in the tents of the riches, the wicked riches. It's kind of nice to have someone at the door, particularly when it's raining outside. But there's another psalm that's a favorite, Psalm 139, which talks about we, we never get away from God's presence, and it's not something that we're even trying to do. You know, if I, if I ascend to heaven, well, that's, that's God's throne. He lives there. I can make my bread in, bed in, in the grave even. You know, the, God's there. If I try to escape, take the wings of the morning and go to the othermost parts of the sea. I actually saw something this last week about certain places where no one's ever been. Certain mountaintops, no one's ever been. You can't get up there. Others, it's like, yeah, about 300 people have made it up there, and about 25% of the people who tried died doing it. I don't need to go there because it doesn't matter where I am. God is with me. God is with you as you trust in Christ. In fact, that's the big, from Psalm 23, that's the big comfort, isn't it? I don't fear, even though I go through the valley of the shadow of death. Why? Because, Lord, you're with me. You're my shepherd. You're with me. Even though things look really bad, you're with me. Well, God's presence is displayed everywhere. God's presence is everywhere. But there is, from our Old Testament reading, a rather glorious demonstration of the presence of God in the temple. And God did this specifically. It was a holy place. Why was it a holy place? It had holy people there. Well, no, no. It had special furniture, holy furniture. It did have holy furniture, but that's not what made it holy. That's not what made it special. What made it special, as you heard that read, the Spirit of God came down, fire to hit the sacrifice, to receive the sacrifice. And the Spirit of God, the glory of God was so big that everyone fled. They couldn't stay there. And the people on the outside, their face hit the pavement. The glory of God was there. That's the place. That's why the temple of God was holy. That's why that people would, would look to the temple of God and pray, just as in a way of orientating, knowing it's the presence of God that we're praying to, as Daniel did uh, when he was even in Babylon. Could this temple contain God? Well, no. That's even part of Solomon's prayer, isn't it? I can't make a house that'll contain you, but you said to do this, we're doing this, bless this here. It can't limit you, but God's presence is there. Now, we are the temple of God. As you trust in Jesus Christ, as Peter said, you, you, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you're baptized and you will receive the gift of the Spirit, even as you've seen. This is what he preached on Pentecost. You will receive the presence of God, the presence of God in you. Now, I'll tell you, if you think about that, that's, that's really great. And that's what is ministering to your heart day by day. 
That's what's correcting you when you need corrected. That's what's comforting you when you need comfort. And it's more than that, that when we get together, the Holy Spirit is here. God's presence is here. We are here as believers with the Spirit of God, not just as individuals, but we're here to worship God, and God's presence is here. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's not just that we're individually such, but we meet God here because God is here in our midst. We are in God's house. Let's look at verse 19 again. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, praise the Lord, but you are fellow citizens and saints and members of the household of God. That's a house. Well, what's this house look like? This is a house that has a strong foundation. And Paul tells us, well, what's this house built on? It's built on Christ. Verse 20, it's built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. The foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Now we just sang a hymn that was the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ her Lord. And I've heard someone say, well, I don't think I should sing that because it's uh, the prophets and the apostles are part of the foundation. Say, don't miss the point. Don't miss the point. Why are the prophets and the apostles foundational? It's not something in them. Well, what is it then? It's the word of God. It's what God has said. It is God's word. In fact, the word of the scripture, the whole scripture, is the words of Jesus. It's the words of God, the word of God. All of the New Testament, you know, we don't have Jesus recorded as writing anything except in John chapter 8, he's writing in the sand, you know. where the. But all of this that's written is Jesus' words through his apostles. That's what he gave them to do. How are they foundational? They're foundational because they're communicating the words of Christ. The apostles are not co-founders of the Christian religion. I heard somebody say that. Well, the apostle Paul's a co-founder. No. What do you think the apostle Paul would think of that statement? Oh, you're the co-founder of Christianity. He'd be horrified. He said, I'm a sinner. In fact, I'm the chief of sinners. Praise God that Jesus came to save sinners. And I'm like number one on the list. No, Christ is the foundation. What are they, what are, what's their function then? Their function is as the witness because of the scripture. In Matthew 16, you know, Jesus says, who do you say that? Men say that I am. Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. What did Jesus say? Oh, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father is in heaven, the spirit of God. And I'll tell you, your name is, is, uh, is Rocky, because on this rock, I'm going to build my church. I won't say, yo. yes, I will. Yo, Adrian. No, it, it, it's Rocky. It, it's like a nickname. It's because this is the thing on which we hear. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Now, how strong was that rock? The next thing he said was wrong. Well, Jesus is talking about, well, I've got to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. I'm going to be raised again. And Peter pulls him aside and says, no, Lord, no, no, no. You're, you're the Christ. This is not the way this goes. And what did Jesus say? He flipped around. Get behind me, Satan. He began to talk to his disciples. No, that's not the right thing. Now, listen. Peter denied Jesus three times. You are not hurt by his denial, nor are you saved by his confession. It's the word of God that is foundational, the word of Christ which is foundational. And so what are we saying? We're saying the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. He is the one on whom all this is built the Bible is important. It's important to say how important the Bible is. Church of Jesus is built on the word of God. It's preached, and the Holy Spirit uses the reading, and especially the preaching of the word of God, to, to convict and to convert and to encourage us in faith in Christ. It's important. 
We're dead in our trespasses and sins. And as I said, as Paul says, faith comes by hearing the word of God. It's foundational. It's from the very beginning. Another passage that I really focus on a lot is in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It describes the church this way. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. The first thing it says is the apostles' doctrine. You know, they didn't have all the apostles' doctrine written down. They were getting it from their mouths. In one sense, the church is more mature now than it was then. We actually have the word here. We can read it. We can memorize it. We can meditate on it. We can continue to be blessed by it. What is the apostles' doctrine? Well, you just heard some of it. It's the scriptures itself. This is why this is so important. Not just the words of the apostles, but the prophets, too. Now, who are the prophets? Well, there were prophets in the New Testament, but we think of the prophets of the Old Testament as well. And if you look at the Bible, about four-fifths of it, maybe 80%, is the Old Testament, which is the Word of God. Some people will look and they want to downplay the Hebrew Scriptures and the Old Testament. That sounds like a lot of judgment there. Well, there is judgment there. But if you haven't looked at the cross, you don't understand what judgment is. There, the judgment of God is poured out upon Jesus Christ so that it is not given to us as we trust in him. The Hebrew Scriptures are the Word of God. We understand them in the light of the New Testament. But when Jesus is doing battle with Satan in Matthew chapter 4, what does he answer? It is written. And what's he quote? The scriptures, the word of God. When Jesus preaches in his hometown, he opens up the book of Isaiah and he reads it. And he says, this is now fulfilled in your hearing. They thought, whoa. The Old Testament. We're looking in Sunday school at the book of Hebrews. And, well, there's a lot of quotation from the scriptures, the Old Testament. And when the apostle Paul preaches to Jewish people, as you read in Acts, he preaches and expounds the Old Testament. Now, when he's in Athens, they don't know that as much. He's not quoting that as much. But the Old Testament is the word of God. The Old Testament is not written by some other God. The Old Testament was written for us. It's foundational for us. St. Augustine said, uh, what is concealed in the old is revealed in the new. We understand the Old Testament in a new way because of the New Testament. Because what makes the New Testament special? Well, it was written in Greek, and that was more of a broad... No, no, I mean, yes, it is, but that's, that's not what makes it more special. What makes it more special? It talks about Christ. It expounds Christ, and so now we know who Jesus is. Bottom line, Old Testament's still very important. It's foundational, but we understand it in light of the New Testament. Verse 20. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ being the cornerstone, foundation, the word of God, Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. I hope you're not surprised by this, that here in the church of Jesus we talk about Jesus. We talk about what he has said, what he has taught, but it's more than just what he said and what he's taught. It's what he has done and who he is. The words of Christ are vital, and as I said, really the whole Old Testament is from his apostles to be his word. But the teaching on Jesus is not all, and the teaching of Jesus is not all of our faith. Our faith is founded on Christ himself, Jesus himself. He came to earth as a baby. He grew. He demonstrated what it is to live And he died for us and was risen again. The church is built on the person of Christ. For you to be part of the church of Jesus, you must personally have faith in him. You must personally be connected to him. So we understand the Old Testament in light of the New. It doesn't mean the Old Testament's bad. I mean, read Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. These are important. God creating all things. 
where sin came from, even where salvation will come from, is in the beginning. Christ is the cornerstone, and the writings, the apostles and prophets, with what is the house built? What are the stones of the house of God? The answer to that is, we are. You are. You're actually the bricks, the stones. Verse 21, in whom, in Christ, the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. The house of God is being built and is growing. It's kind of an unusual description of a building. It's growing. Well, it's being built, and this is all temporary, but when it's built, then that's, the, no, that's not the way the church of God goes. It's growing. It's being built with living stones. Peter describes this. He says, you yourselves are living stones built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You're the building. I'm the building. We're the building. It matters that you're here. It's not just that, well, the preacher's got to be there. That's important. No, you have to be here, too. You're part of the people of God. Whether you're here or providentially hindered for being here, or we travel, we join, we're part of God's people. We're not just individuals who come to worship God and I thought I'd want to do this today, so I showed up. No, we, we come to be part of the people of God. Even if you're just right now with the people of God here. We're not just a bunch of stones haphazardly thrown into a pile. We're placed by the Lord, the master builder. That's interesting, though. Have you thought about this? The Lord may place you next to someone very different from you. That happens a lot, and it happens for a reason. One is to transfer, ask for a transfer. Lord, can you move me to a different place in the building here? Maybe move that other stone to a different place in the building. That's not God's purpose. God takes odd-shaped stones, and sometimes as he puts them together, the rough edges come off. Well, that sounds painful. Well, yeah, of course it is. But God does that because of his love for you and for me. This is why you shouldn't be quick to leave a congregation over a disagreement. Because this is what I've found. People who bolt because of something that they should have stayed, <laughs> they find out the next church has the same problem. And maybe the one after that, eventually they may realize they're bringing it with them or the Lord's trying to teach them something. We are to grow in unity. We are to grow in joy. The house of God is not a sad place. This is where God lives. We should be rejoicing in this. I heard that preached in a sermon a couple weeks ago. We should be rejoicing always, giving thanks always. This leads to unity because when we're rejoicing in the Lord, we're all focusing on our glorious Lord and we're doing it together. What makes us one is not that we're alike, but that we have the same Christ and we're being changed by Christ. We also grow in number. People come to faith, not any old way, but through Christ and the word of Christ. Verse 22 also gives us the reason for this house. We're being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is the end point. This is the purpose. And this is stunning to me. We are put together to be the very place where God dwells. Does that mean we're a magnificent structure? Well, I don't know what other people think, but God is here. That makes it magnificent. It's not because of the status of the people here. It's here because God is here. Our purpose is to be the place where the Holy Spirit is manifested and God dwells in us. You know, you might not be aware of that all the time, but it's still true. God's in you. God's with you. 
Something even greater happens, though, when all of these living stones come together. You come expecting the presence of God. Do you come expecting the presence of God when you come to church? Well, it's just a little church. Come looking for the presence of God. Come seeing the presence of God. Church factions happen when people forget the presence of God and the glory of God and the worship of God and the question comes down to who's in charge here? Somebody says, you're not going to be the boss of me. Someone else says, oh yes I am. And that's where the faction happens. That's where the trouble happens. And I love preaching about this when there's not one going on. Praise the Lord for that right now. But you've been in churches where that's the issue. And what is it? It's all about Who's in charge? And they left off the real answer to that question. Because not only is the church's one foundation, Jesus Christ, her Lord, but the church's head is always Jesus Christ, her Lord. This is the place the Holy Spirit inhabits. And as we come, it becomes about God and not us. I'm going to ask if you join me in our gatherings when we come that we would see the presence and the power of God here. That you'd come expecting the presence and the power of God who loves you, who saves you, who empowers you and equips you to do what he would have you do, his will, the things that he's prepared ahead of time, that you'd walk in them. As he said, be one of the living stones. God's presence inhabits us here. As we do that together, we see the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it. Amen. Heavenly Father, I ask that your word, which shows us who we are in Christ, directs us who we are in Christ, would move in us powerfully, that we would live that way, be excited about that, treasure that, love that, O oh Lord, that we would see your glory and that we'd learn to show your glory. I pray for any who are not knowing Christ, that you would open their heart, that they would know your presence. And Lord, for those who trust you and want to know you more, Lord, we, we ask that you would grant that prayer as well, that your presence would be seen in us, even that the world would see our good works and realize that they are yours and glorify you. This we pray through our Savior, our Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's continue.